I need, I need my. Yeah, look how fast <laughs> this gameplay is. Whoa. This is too fast for me, guys. Let me get back in the action. Oh, oh you, you got out. You got out. Yeah, I got your rest. Do it. Oh. Yeah, some good stuff right there. Play, oh, oh Cammy outplayed that guy. Hit him, primary. I, I, my primary weapon, let me just pull out my primary weapon. Oh, yeah, look at that. Died immediately. <laughs> They're team shotting, Drew. They're team shotting. What no, is this? Team shotting doesn't exist in this game. Stop it. Oh, my God. He was always a slight. No, you dumbass. Look at that. There was always either, it was either, it he was, was coming in the smash, so I smash first and I die. Bob, you gotta admit, it was always something that could either one tap or two tap that in all of Destiny. Look, I traded again for like the tenth time this fucking game. Watch him outplay this guy too. Oh, oh, I traded again. Holy shit. I'm top fragging right now and I haven't shot a gun. We're about to get Nova. Oh, I got outplayed. I got outplayed. It's in fucking Storm Caller. The ability to get myself Let me just do that real quick. That's a huge display of skill. Definitely a, definitely a skill gap present there. I just outshot him twice with sidearms. They're so much more powerful oh, than I the primary. <laughs> Look at this! They melt! Oh, Cam, good outplay. Good outplay. Oh, they don't have gun skill! Oh, they never played! Outplayed! This is grenade. And I get sniped for the end. That's pretty much Destiny in a nutshell. I've been reading the Bungie.net forums lately, and people have been arguing whether Juggernaut or Shoulder Charge is superior. Now most people lean towards Juggernaut now, but what people forget, I'll slow it down for you, is that Shoulder Charge is a mobility tool. Shoulder Charge is a mobility tool. Shoulder Charge is a mobility tool. Try to imagine that you're playing Trials of Osiris, some asshole slides around the corner like this, snipes, and then Shoulder Charges away. Yeah, that's pretty scary, isn't it? What you want to do is run against a rock, a wall, a flat surface, and charge your shoulder charge. What this accomplishes is it lets you prime a shoulder charge for an unsuspecting guardian around the corner. You get a shoulder charge without actually traveling any distance. So like I was saying earlier, it's not so fun to be on the receiving end of this. In fact, it's quite scary. Take a look at this clip. So basically, what this clip is showing you is that you're only exposed for 1.7 seconds. Now we know the Doctrine can kill in about half that time, but the name of the game is Evasiveness. If you can't hit your opponent, time to kill doesn't matter. Time to kill doesn't matter. Time to kill doesn't matter. And here's a challenge for you. Name me one player that can react to this. While I admit that there were fun times to be had in Destiny 1, and I did push the sandbox to its absolute limits on most characters, frankly, I just feel spoiled by Destiny 2's sandbox. The fact that everybody has to use a primary makes me feel more powerful by comparison. You also have to consider that with the time to kill difference, this makes movement even more important than it was in Destiny 1. Although they did limit some movement abilities, Shoulder Charge has pretty much stayed the same, with the exception that you can't use it in the air but this particular technique is about sliding in the shoulder charges, which is unchanged. So to cleanly spell it out for you, I'm just as evasive as I was in Destiny 1, but it takes the enemy more shots to kill me, so I'm more likely to live, and this technique is actually better than it was in Destiny 1. Some other things to note are the fact that your shoulder charge, when primed, does not go away like it did in Destiny 1. It actually stays permanent in Destiny 2. Also, with the weapon loadout system in Destiny 2, you have a primary kinetic, a primary energy, and a power weapon, as opposed to Destiny 1's system of primary, special, 
heavy. This means that you could have a pulse, a sidearm, and a sniper rifle, instead of being limited to a sword. What this translates to is having a consistent mid-range primary, a consistent point-blank primary, and a long-range sniper rifle which, dependent on the user and how accurate they are, can get full mileage out of it. And other people might not have power ammo when you have power ammo, because if you use your primaries well, you save your abilities and you play as a team, you should be securing power ammo. Maybe they get it, but then you just play around it, and at some point you're going to have a sniper rifle uncontested, which is extremely powerful. As you can see on the screen, the Iron Wreath D from Destiny 1 and the Vertical Orbit QSM from Destiny 2 are direct analogs of each other. In Destiny 1, sidearms were problematic because they were better than other primary weapons outside of their intended range. For example, when you compare a Destiny 1 hand cannon to a Destiny 1 sidearm, the sidearm was better at point blank range, better at close range, worse at medium range, and better at long range. I'm not even kidding. In Destiny 2, however, sidearms have taken on a completely different role, and that's solely to be a melee helper. But this doesn't mean on their own they can't outshoot a hand cannon or a submachine gun in close quarters combat. Countdown. Guys, this is ESCA, this is serious. This is a serious business. This is, yeah, dude. this is the match that gets us out of open. We cannot lose the pistol round, we can't afford to save. Alright, Cam. Smoke Grotto. Alright, Dre, I need you to fly I need you to flash Rico. I'm gonna flash Rico. Oh, I know this guy. He always, uh, he's always top frag. There we go. We got him. Good team. All right, buy that off. Picked it up. We didn't buy armor, so be careful. Nading, Dark. Audit. They're flashed. Dead. I saw him. I saw him. Alright, I got the cross map flash. Oh. Alright, we won, guys. Alright, NA's back. NA's back. Before you say it, I'd argue that the vertical orbit is just as good on controller as it is on keyboard and mouse, because on controller, you get sticky aim assist up close, but on keyboard and mouse, you get very forgiving hip fire, which allows you to have a very fast strafe. Now the reason that I chose the Vertical Orbit out of every sidearm in Destiny 2 is because of its damage model. Now let me preface this by saying a shoulder charge does exactly 110 damage, so 90 plus 20. In order to secure the kill, you need to make up for another 90 damage, because 90 plus 20 plus 90 equals 200. I can shoulder charge this man. Oh, that was beautiful! I can't believe you got that. In order to make this shoulder charge build really shine, you need guns that can hit 90 plus damage to the body within the slide distance of a shoulder charge slide. Now although Vertical Orbit doesn't hit 90 damage within the slide window, it does 87 a lot easier than Better Devils or Risk Runner. In order to survive 3 shots of the Vertical Orbit, you have to have over 6 resilience, so 7 or more. Remember that handling does apply here, so pulling out the weapon as you slide does apply to making the slide window which is the time between sliding and your shoulder charge having to activate or dissipate. So basically what I'm getting at is as long as you hit three body shots while sliding, you can shoulder charge just like Destiny 1, and if you want to do it infinitely, you need to wear the insurmountable skull for it, because shoulder charge kills will refill the shoulder charge. But like I was alluding to at the beginning of the video, it's better to use shoulder charge as a mobility tool and not a killing tool. Insurmountable skull for it lets you do both. And as if that wasn't enough already, Getting a shoulder charge kill refills your health and a portion of your grenade energy. Which is good because with the top tree you normally don't get your health back and you have two grenades, kind of like you're wearing the armamentarium from Destiny 1. So hopefully this has painted the picture, that the Iron Wreath and Vertical Orbit and the Striker Titan in general aren't that different from Destiny 1 to Destiny 2. Likewise, the Blind Perdition and Last Perdition are pretty similar. I would argue that the Cadenza Pulse Rifle is closer to the Blind Perdition, but the Last Perdition is better overall because of the Rampage perk, so why not just use Last Perdition? You also might think, well, it doesn't have counterbalance, but you could just use an Energy Recoil mod to accomplish the same thing without significantly hurting your own stats. So on both console and PC, the last perdition is my go-to pulse rifle. This is because it's an adaptive archetype, and as it suggests, it's all around good. You can use it at pretty much any range, though it really shines at medium long. You might say, Cami, but mine are Uriel's! And to that I would say, yes, Uriel's gift does kill in about 0.05 seconds faster at its intended range, but you're using a pulse rifle. 
So unless you have Rampage, don't fight a Uriel's Gift at its intended range. Or alternatively, because we're not perfect human beings, pop in and out of cover because you're shooting a burst of fire and they're shooting a continuous stream. In other words, your damage output is greater than theirs even though their time to kill is slightly better. But we can do even better than this. We can jump our resilience stat to 9 or 10 and force the Uriel's Gift to take an extra shot to kill, therefore making the guns pretty much on par with each other. But in this case, the last perdition would actually be better because it has Rampage, it has burst damage so you can peek in and out of cover, and it's overall more effective at long distances. So on paper, once you stack resilience, Last Perdition is better than Uriel's Gift. There's no arguing. The only thing you could argue is that Uriel's Gift is easier to use, which then is kind of an insult to yourself because what you're saying to me is, Cammy, I'm not able to hit precision shots popping in and out of cover. I have to use a fully automatic weapon with body shot precision ratios that are pretty manageable. And if I get outplayed, it's just because the enemy team team shot me. And if you're thinking along those lines that this is only a team shot game, then use a weapon that is better for team shotting, aka something with more burst damage and rampage for even more damage potential. It's complaints like this that really scare me in the direction that this game's going towards, but I'll get off this tangent because in my I Lost video, I've already talked about this ad nauseum. But back on subject, I put all the puzzle pieces in order, you can finally see what the big picture looks like, and all I'm saying is that this build is very similar to the Destiny 1 analog. But it comes with the small caveat that you have to hit body shots when you slide for a shoulder charge, and you have to be more accurate in general. And is that something we should be complaining about, that it's harder to snake out these one-shot abilities? I guess that's for the viewer to decide, but you already know where my opinion lies. Anyhow, I forgot to mention lightning grenades. Lightning grenades are very powerful, even in Destiny 2, but less so on mouse and keyboard, aka PC. Lol. I shot it out of the air. What this clip demonstrates is that you can shoot grenades out of the air, or if they land on the wall behind you, you can quickly 180 and precisely shoot it off the wall, rendering it useless. On console, however, this is really unlikely that someone will be able to do that unless they're KJ Hovey. For argument's sake though, we're gonna assume that most of the community does not have the ability to shoot lightning grenades off the wall instantly, or to shoot them out of the air. Just for argument's sake, follow me. While the cone is slightly less obnoxious than Destiny 1, and the cooldown is definitely worse, lightning grenades still offer some of the best damage in PvP, making it very very easy to clean up in a single headshot burst from Last Perdition. But it also makes an even easier cleanup from a shoulder charge, which then in turn gives you grenade energy back, letting you have OP lightning grenades all the time. If lightning grenades aren't your style, I mentioned a couple other guns that can hit the 90 damage while sliding into a shoulder charge, and that was Risk Runner and Better Devils. But Risk Runner is special because if you hurt yourself with arc, let's say a pulse grenade or a flashbang, it activates the Risk Runner perk while only giving you partial damage but the enemy full damage. So in other words, if you can bounce your grenade off a wall or stall a pulse grenade to land into somebody and to you at the same time, then this means that the Risk Runner can hit that effective slide window in less shots. While that's totally gimmicky, I still think it's worth mentioning just because people are really turned off by the thought of using a sidearm. And while we're on the subject of fun facts, just like in D1 you can slide fusion, you can still do it in D2. Well, that about covers this build, so let me recap on what makes it strong. One. If you use your shoulder charge for a kill, it's not burned, you get it back instantly, you get your health, and nade energy, which you have two grenades, so that already is strong. The sidearm combos with the shoulder charge, and the last perdition is all around just good. And when we're talking melee fights, or fights with specific arc types of guns, you have 10 resilience, so you get to tank it out much better, and if you get the shoulder charge kill, you'll probably get all your health back. If I had to rate this out of 10, I'd give it a 6 because it's not the most user-friendly build, but if you're a Destiny Ace, one of the better players out there, you'll get a lot of mileage out of this playing as a really aggressive striker titan. In future build videos, I'm going to focus more on user-friendly builds like the Attunement of the Sky on Dawnblade. My friend Drewski just covered that, I'll link that in the description if you're down. And perhaps I'll make a video about Stompy High Jump. Influenced by Bakken Gangsta himself, it's a very 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 strong build, yet it's also user-friendly enough that almost anybody can pick it up, but the experts can choose to use accurate inner weapons to give them even more of an edge. Well, that brings this video to a close, so let me know in the comments section if you enjoyed it, I'm gonna continue on in these build vids, and whenever I have free time, I'll upload commentaries as usual. Thank you guys.